This morning we're continuing the sermon series that we've been in here for, I think this is the seventh week. This sermon series has been called Upside Down. This idea that things are not always as they seem to be and sometimes just because you see something doesn't make it real. I have a few images I want to show you this morning. Put the first one up there. Now that looks absolutely incredible, looks like a really, really cool waterfall, but don't be deceived. The guy standing there in the picture is a chalk artist. That is drawn. Yeah, it looks pretty real to me. Let's go to the next one. Now about this one, I might be crazy, but when I look at this picture, them hearts are spinning, man. So I don't know, if, is anybody else seeing spinning hearts? That is, that is not a video, that is an image. And I'm pretty sure that means my brain is broken. <laughs> All right, let's go to the next one. All right, what do you see here? Somebody in the, in the first service said, it's a duck rabbit. <laughs> That's what it is. Said you're not wrong. You're not wrong. Not wrong. Okay, I'm sure at some point in your life you've heard somebody say this. Listen, I'm going to have to see it to believe it. Today I'm going to suggest to you that the opposite is true, especially with God. That you have to believe it in order to see it. Hebrews 11, 1 through 3 says this. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what was seen was not made out of things that are visible. So I believe that scripture is telling us a few things here that what is unseen has the power to impact the seen. Now in scripture, there's this really neat story about a centurion that seeks the help of Jesus. He has a servant that is not well, is sick and dying. So he sends out a messenger to go find Jesus and he he finds Jesus. And then Jesus is on his way to the centurion. And then he sends another messenger and says, you know what, Jesus, I don't want to waste your time. He says, "I, I get it. He says, I'm in authority too. He says, I understand that if I tell somebody to go do something, they go do it because they have to. So I believe you, Jesus, can speak the words and my servant will be well. This idea that this this soldier understood that he didn't need to see Jesus in order to see Jesus work, right? He didn't need to be in the presence of Jesus. He didn't think that Jesus needed to touch his servant, only that Jesus needed to speak the word so that what was unseen had the power to affect what was Seen This idea that if you believe that God can, then you will see God work. See, but I think that believing has not only the power to change what we see, but kind of how we perceive the world. That believing changes the way that we see. And if you're following along in your outline, this is the first step. Believing changes the way that we see God. In high school... I went to see a movie in movie theaters called Constantine. And little did I know when I went to see this movie that my life was going to be changed forever. Now, some people, normal people, go to see a movie like The Passion of the Christ, and that changes their life forever, not me. For me, it was Constantine. I was sitting in the movie theater, and there's this part in the movie where this guy is talking to an angel. and His name is John. And the angel says to John, says, John, you know God exists, but you don't believe in him. It was as if someone had peered into my little high school soul and spoke directly to me. As if to say, Will, you you, you go to church and and you're a pastor's kid and, and you got all the answers. You know God exists, but you quit believing in him. I think this is what the Pharisees did. And I think it's a threat to all of us that are Christians. That sometimes we make it up in our head that God is real and what we do is we leave no room for doubt. 
And what I mean by that is sometimes when God becomes a fact, he's no longer personal and we quit believing in him. When you choose to ignore your doubts, really what you do is you choose to quit seeking him and you kill your faith. Because can I be honest with you today? Faith can't exist without doubt. What happens when you don't believe in God, you begin to live out of your own strength. You begin to leave, live for only what your eyes can see. And all mystery and all miracles become lost. What happens is, as you become Thomas Jefferson. How many of you have heard of the Jefferson Bible? By raise of hands, how many? Not too many. Basically what happened is Thomas Jefferson took the Bible. He, he knew God exists, right? He took the Bible and he took out everything from the Bible that was unbelievable. So there wasn't a lot of the Bible left. And it's called the Jefferson Bible. Sometimes that's what we do in our lives. But we've got to understand that faith is not the absence of doubt. Rather, it's the assurance of hope. Hope in someone bigger than you. I want to read to you this morning Isaiah 31.1. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help. Woe to those of you that rely on horses. Those of you that trust in chariots just because they are many. And trust in horsemen just because they are very strong. But you do not look to the Holy One of Israel. You do not consult the Lord. See, when you believe, you look to God first. Whether it's good or bad, you look to God. My question for us this morning was, when is the last time you consulted God? And this is, this is hard for me. Did you consult him before or after you had already made up your mind? And were you patient if he didn't answer you right away? And were you willing to seek in the word of God to see if he had already given you the answer? We've got to understand that no matter how many victories we win on this earth, eventually we will face a task that is impossible. And it, it's okay. Maybe the first task that we face that's impossible, impossible is death. That's where we need Jesus. It's not a matter of time. It's not a matter of if we need Jesus, period. I'm going to suggest to you, don't just ask for help. Seek his help. Seek his spirit. Seek his people. Quit trusting only in what you can see. Quit trusting only in what you can feel. Because our sight is biased. It's shaded. It's limited. See, I think believing in God changes the way that we see because it changes us to where we start seeking God first. And in his word, he says, listen, if you seek me, you will find me. Almost as if to say that there is something hidden that we do not have, and that is the truth of God without God. And then when you find God, you realize that he didn't just come as a savior. Like he came as a friend, an advocate, somebody that wants to be in a personal relationship with you. You begin to view God and you see his law and, and you don't see his law as just some set of rules, but you see it as his love and his protection and his guidance. You begin to face things in your life that, that you get rejected from and you begin to see that rejection in your life is really God's protection. You begin to find out that he is far more trustworthy than you are. The more you seek, the more you find deep within your soul that every hour I need thee. See, believing changes the way that we see God, not as some powerful cosmic force out there somewhere in the universe, but rather a perfect, loving Father that longs to be near to us. Not just some being that exists, but a personal friend that wants to live life with us. See, God took it upon himself to wrap himself in flesh, to be here to die on a cross because he wanted to make himself available to us. Believing changes the way that we see God. 
I also think that believing changes the way that we see our circumstances. James 1, 2 through 4 says this. Don't run from tests and hardships, brothers and sisters. As difficult as they are, you will ultimately find joy in them if you embrace them. Your faith will blossom under pressure and teach you true patience as you endure. And true patience brought by endurance will equip you to be complete along the long journey and cross the finish line mature and complete and wanting nothing. See, I think what James is trying to tell us here in this scripture is that we've got to change our perspective because it is our faith that helps us get through the difficult parts of life because there's going to be times where we don't know the outcome and it looks scary but we've got to know that we serve a God that has already won the victory faith to know that guess what God is bigger than your circumstances and that God has the power to work all things for the good of those who love him so I don't know what it is for you today. I don't know what terrible circumstances you face. Maybe it's failure. Maybe it's pain. Maybe it's that feeling of being stuck or trials. And these things, they're, they're leaving you hurt and sad and frustrated and depressed. And can I get an amen for exhausted? Please. Am I the only one that deals with that? Come on now. By raise of hands... How many of you would say there's something that's happened in your life that you wish you could go back and do differently? Yeah. Sounds about right. You know what the problem with that is, though? Is you will unlearn the lesson and the knowledge and the wisdom that you gained in your mistake and failure. You know, as difficult as they are, our... our our failures, our mistakes, they're, they're far too important an aspect of our growth. After only being here for about a year, I made a really, really, really poor decision. And I found myself in, in the office with, with Pastor Steve. And I thought I was going to lose my job. And, and praise be to God, he gave me a second chance. But as difficult as that conversation was, as difficult as it was for me to admit who I was being and what needed to be changed, if not for that conversation, I wouldn't still be here today and I wouldn't be the man that I am. Without your failures and your mistakes, who would you be? Let me take it a step further. Hebrews eleven thirteen 13 says this. All these died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on this earth. You know, it seems rather unfortunate to me. You know, this scripture is referring to Abraham and Moses, these, these people who God made these incredible promises to, but they never saw the promises. That seems kind of unfortunate to me. But I got to be honest that's where we'd be wrong. Because what they realized is that being with God is better than his promises. It's funny to me, I, I would have never of ever in a million years thought this. You know what one of the number one questions I get asked as a pastor? You ready for this? And I, I used to have this lady. She'd call me, Pastor Bill. She'd say, Pastor Bill, is my pet going to heaven? Really? Did you, there's no right answer to this question. Because if I tell them what I really think, I'm going to get in trouble. Right? They'd be like, ah. So you know what? I, I try to be as political as I can when I'm asked this question. This is why I tell people. When you get to heaven, you ain't going to care. You are not going to care whether or not your animal is with you when you get there. You might care now. And, and that's, that's this perspective that I'm talking about. It's this idea that we quit living for earth and start living for eternity. That our struggles in this world will, will soon become shaded by the glories of the world to come. The realization that the, the current struggles we have, they're only temporary, but life with Christ is eternal. And when we believe that, it changes the way we see our circumstances. 
I also believe that believing changes the way we see people. Somewhere around 2002, my grandmother got cancer. And we were living in Tampa, Florida, and she was in Peoria, Illinois. And maybe two times we got to fly from Tampa to Peoria to visit her before she passed away. And one time in particular, we, we had to make this flight from Tampa to Chicago. And then we, I don't know if you guys, have you been on those little dinger planes they put you on where you feel every bump in the air? Yeah. One of those planes that I have to walk in like this because I'm too tall. They got one row on this side, and there's two rows on this side, and, and I have no idea that my, why my parents thought it would be a good idea for me and my brother to sit next to each other on this plane. I think they sat somewhere else on the plane, and we don't know who those people are. But a couple rows up on the single aisle, there's this elder, elderly woman, and she's staring at us. Now, I, I just, I, I just want to be real for a second. Everybody needs a good stare every now and then. You know what I'm saying? You get like just five minutes. You don't even know what you're looking at. You're, you're, just, you're just having a good stare. That's not what I'm talking about, y'all. I'm talking about this entire hour-long flight this woman is staring at us. And, and she's up in front a couple rows. So she's like turned around staring at us. Listen, I believe I'm an attractive man, but I don't think I'm that attractive. You know what I'm saying? I, we have no idea, and maybe it's just because we're being loud and obnoxious. I don't know why, but at, at some point, I told my brother, I said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to count to three, and we're both going to look at her at the same time, right? So I'm sitting there, I'm like, one, two, three. And we both just stare right at her, and she does nothing. <laughs> she is unfazed. Can I, can I say that there are people in your life that will drive you crazy. There are people in your life that my wife calls energy vampires. They will suck all of your energy. And here's the worst part about it. Sometimes there's nothing you can do about it. Sometimes you're stuck on a plane with them and there's literally nothing that you can do. It can't be helped because why we can't control people. You know, as a pastor, I get asked every now and then what to do with these kind of people in your life. And my response is always, have you been praying about it? And then as I dig deeper, I ask them the question, okay, maybe you've been praying about it, but have you taken the time to pray specifically for them? Luke 6, 28 tells us this, bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. Did you hear that? Pray, pray for those, pray for the people that mistreat you. Not because your prayers are going to change them, because your prayers are going to change you. See, it's not about changing the way that they act. It's about changing the way that you see them. A reminder from us, from God, that people are not as hopeless as we make them out to be. There's this story in Scripture, uh, this ruler named Jarius seeks Jesus. He has a 12-year-old daughter that is dying. And he leaves his home, leaves his daughter there, goes out to find Jesus. He finds Jesus, and Jesus agrees. He said, okay, I'll come. I'll, I'll come to your house and help. And on their way, this is what happens. This is Luke 8, 49-55. While he was still speaking, someone from Jairus' house came and said, listen, your daughter is dead. Don't trouble the teacher anymore. Don't trouble Jesus anymore. But Jesus, on hearing this, answered him, Do not fear, only believe, and she will be well. If you're taking notes today, I want you to circle only believe like six times. Listen to this. Don't, don't listen to what this man is saying. Don't be afraid. Only believe. Believe in me, and she will be well. And when he came to the house, he said, Do not weep. For she is not dead, but sleeping. And then they, they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. I want to pause for a second. What did we talk about earlier in this message? The difference between knowing a fact and believing in God. 
They knew she was dead, but God says, only believe. And what happened? He called saying, child, arise. And what happened? She got up at once. I'm going to take a wild guess and say that there are people that you know that are spiritually dead. But I want you to see here in Scripture the difference of how they treated this little girl when she was dead. They'd given up something very important. They'd given up all hope. Let's go back to Hebrews 11.1. 1. What is that? Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Conviction of what? Things not seen. Can I just say that as Christians, we do not have the power to declare the dead. See, these people have tried everything in their power to heal this little girl. But guess what? Nothing worked because Jesus was the only one that could heal her. Maybe this will help it sink in a little bit. Are you guys familiar with the, the nursery rhyme about Humpty Dumpty? Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses, all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. You want to know why? Only the king, only the king could piece him back together. How many people in your life have you tried to save? How many people in your life have you tried to control? I want to suggest something to you this morning. What if we quit burying people and left our homes to find Jesus and to beg him to move? What would it look like to be people that cling to hope for the people around us? Instead, we begin to be people that pray circles around those in our lives that are dying. Came across this verse this week. I was really convicted by it. It's 1 Thessalonians 3.10. We pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is ever lacking in your faith. It was really convicting to me because sometimes I'm so much more energy and effort trying to change people in the way I think they should live and I felt like this scripture was telling me, maybe you should be more concerned about praying for people. And maybe if you're not seeing change in people, it's because you're not praying earnestly enough. See, because I think that when we see people through the eyes of hope, they don't continue to be the enemy. Instead, we begin to treat them differently. We surround them with prayer. It changes the way that we feel about them. We speak to them. It changes the way that we look at them when we don't think they're dead. Jesus said, you've heard an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. He says, that stops with me. Why? Why does that stop? Because I believe in hope. Hope that things can be different. Hope that love can change where hate cannot. Believing changes the way that we see other people this is really important. It also changes the way we see ourselves. Because if we cannot love ourselves, how in the world could we ever love the people around us? I grew up playing chess with my grandfather. And I played with him so many times. I can only ever remember winning once. And it's because he accidentally knocked over his king in forfeit. And I'm pretty sure he did that on... He did it on purpose to make me feel good, you know what I'm saying? I just grew up thinking that my grandfather was the greatest chess player ever, but I just realized that like when I played him, I was like 10 years old. So I mean, I mean, how hard was it to beat 10-year-old Will at chess? I mean, it's not even hard to beat 31-year-old Will at chess. So I, you know, there's a strategy in chess where you sacrifice a pawn for a bigger target. It's kind of this like bait and trap. You'll throw a pawn out there make them look real attractive. And, and then they take that pawn, and as soon as they take it, you take their piece instead. And I think sometimes we get that idea with God. But can I tell you this morning that God is not a chess player and you are not a pawn? Philippians 2.13 says this, For it is God who works inside of you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good promise. It's God that worked before you, who died on the cross before you so that he could be in you. God isn't interested in working in spite or instead of you. 
God doesn't want to use you like a tool to be used and then thrown away or discarded. God wants to know you. He wants to work with you. He wants to work in and through you. An opportunity to see what you might be capable of with him working inside of you, with his partnership. See, believing changes the way you see yourself because you realize that it's bigger than just you. And it's not about what you can do. I must look younger than I feel. Because, you know, after I'm done preaching at a lot of different places, there's one thing that I hear a lot. And people will come up to me and say, man, preacher, I'm just surprised that you, you didn't seem nervous at all. I came to a realization a long time ago that my words do not have the power to change lives. Jesus alone has that power. So whether or not my words impact you today is less of a reflection on me and more of a reflection on you and your own spirit and whether or not you're open to hearing from God. I learned a long time ago that you can learn from even the worst sermons if you're willing to listen to God. The good thing is, is that doesn't speak to my talent or my ability at all. And that realization has been one of the biggest stress relievers of my life. But that's not just good news for me. Guess what? That's good news for you too. Why? Because our calling as Christians to pick up our cross, it's not about talent. It's about willingness. So your broken past doesn't disqualify you from being used by God. Only when you believe that to be true will you become complacent in your faith. This idea that sin cannot be defeated in your life if you've already accepted defeat. If you've just accepted, oh, I guess this is who I am. This is who I'm going to be. I, I can't change. And that's why faith changes the way you see you. Because through faith, the victory of Jesus is ours. He came to our situation to overcome so that we might overcome as well. There's a character in the Bible, his name is Samson. By some miracle, he ends up in the hall of faith in Hebrews 11. If you read the story of Samson, you really go, I'm finding it hard to figure out what this dude did right. Because he did a lot wrong. But you know what? In the end, I think this is why he's in the book. In the end, after all of his failures, after all his mistakes, after all his sin, Samson believed in his heart that God would still use him. I want to read to you Judges 16, 22. But the hair on his head began to grow again after it had already been shaved. And I love this because this is a perfect picture of God's grace, his redemptive love. Because when everyone else had given up on him, when his foes thought they had gained victory over him, what does scripture say? But it says his hair was beginning to grow back. When I was younger, I had a really, really bad experience at a haircut place. I mean, this lady jacked up my hair. And all I asked for was a buzz cut. I mean, how hard is that? So I went home and I fixed it myself. And I thought to myself, why am I paying money for something I can do myself? So for the next 10 years, I didn't trust a single person to touch my head, right? Not even my wife. I just shave my head. That's just how I live my life. But then, you know, as you get married, I, I, I thought, man, maybe I should let my, my hair grow out. And, and, you know, she likes it, so I've kept it this way. And now it's, it's been maybe five years or so. And I, I thought about shaving the other day, but kind of nervous. What if it doesn't grow back? <laughs> like, I'm starting to feel that. You know, I wonder how many of us are living our life of faith that way? We're afraid to be used by God because we're afraid that he can't use us or that he won't use us. We're too far gone or too broken. Can I just tell you, if that's you, you've forgotten what Jesus did for you on the cross. Because all that stuff you see, 
That's, see, believing changes the way you see yourself because you no longer see yourself like you see yourself in the mirror, but you see yourself through the lens of Jesus Christ. And you understand what his sacrifice did for you, and that means that you are now responsible to pick up and carry your own cross. And that doesn't mean that you're now perfect, but it means that you're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask Rachel to come back up. There's something that I noticed preparing for this sermon. That everywhere I went and every piece that I was piecing together, faith changes everything. Believing changes the way we see because faith brings hope. Jesus was the embodiment of that hope. You know, that's why Jesus came. You know, everybody thought that Jesus was going to come, the Messiah was going to come, and he was going to be like David with the sword. And they had this big bad enemy called the Romans, and it was an enemy that they could not defeat on their own. And they thought that Jesus was going to show up with the sword, and he was going to take out the Romans, and, and Israel was going to be a great empire again. But if Jesus would have done that, he would have only saved Israel. Instead, God made a different choice. He said, I'm going to send Jesus and he's going to set up a kingdom within the hearts of men and women. A kingdom that can't be touched here on earth. Scripture says, listen, you can fear people all you want to, but don't fear them because they only have the power to kill you. But God, he not only has the power to kill you, but to send you to hell. So what I'm, what I'm saying is, is that, that faith changes everything. Hope changes everything. He died so that we wouldn't be scared of death. That we'd have something better to look forward to. This morning I'm going to ask if our prayer partners would come. and I don't know where you are today and, and maybe you just need somebody to pray for you. You're welcome to come to them. If, if you don't feel like you can come or you don't want to, raise your hand. Somebody will come to you. The altars are open. How many of you today, how many of you are feeling hopeless? How many of you are facing something in your life that you just don't see a good end result? How many of you have people in your life that you know that they think they're facing something hopeless because they don't even know who Jesus is? What would it look like today to pray for them? You know, sometimes we think, ah, God knows what's on my heart. Sometimes we think, you know what, Pastor? Well, I've been praying, and he's not answering. You know what I'm going to tell you? Keep praying. Be patient with God. He's got a plan. He loves you, and he loves the people that you care about. And he loves them more than you do. Lean into God today. Those of you that are hopeless, I hope today that you find hope in a God that gave it all so you could have it all. Rachel, would you sing?
just going to ask if everybody would bow their head and close their eyes. I just want to be intentional about praying for those of you that need hope today. And nobody looking except me. If that's you today, would you slip up your hand? If you say, Pastor, well, I just, I just need some hope. Hope that things are going to be different. Hope that I'm not going to be stuck where I'm at. I see you. I see you. Let me pray for us today. Father God, I'm so thankful for the courage of those who put up their hands. Father God, I just ask that your love, that your presence be so tangible to them right now in this moment and through this week. Lord, that you would find, even, even if it's just small, that you would find a way to, to bring hope, to let them know that you were there, to let them know that they're not alone. Father God, sometimes that's the hardest part. It's just feeling that we're all alone, that nobody understands. It just makes us hopeless. But Father God, when we believe in you, it changes the way we see. It changes the way we see you. Our circumstances, the people around us, the way we see ourselves. It is you that brings hope. So Father God, I just ask that you would move in a mighty way today, Father God, that you would bring hope to the hopeless. We look to you today, Father God. We love you. We praise you. In your holy name, amen. This morning as you leave, there are going to be some, some cute kiddos out there handing out little bags. Maybe they're not so little. I don't even know. But fill them up with food and bring them back. We just want to really bless Sky Ranch this year. Uh, there's, there's nothing more depressing to me than somebody not getting to eat a good meal for Thanksgiving. That's what Thanksgiving's all about, right? So please, if you have the opportunity, let's bless those out of the blessings that we've received from God. Go with God today. You are dismissed. Thanks for being here.